Yeah. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to see any of the other stuff that we've done in any of the other interviews, but one of the things that we like to do is kind of get a sense of who you are, uh -huh. what you're doing, uh -huh. why you're doing what you're doing, uh -huh. and then we'll use that as a, a rabbit hole to climb a, to travel down deeper into specific things that okay. we're on about and that we're interested in. Okay. Okay. Um, so you want me to start there? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, let's see. Where do I start here? What's a good... Um, is the Hawaiian connection an important... Is that what you're trying to... I mean, you, you, you're doing so many different interviews with different people. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going from one end to the other. It's yeah, 3,500 years of code oh. with an emphasis on the past 500 years since the Fortune numbers on the one time scale, social, cultural, right. you know, archaeological, anthropological, so we understand the context of it. And then into the brain and the neurosciences right, and the right. you know, critical 5 to 25 milliseconds that's right, making the right. difference in the processing of the virtual right. reality underlying our experience of reality. Right, right. So that whole spectrum. And <clears throat> different people's difficulty coming into it because of their language biases, right. the structure, the right. phonetic structure of their languages. Right. So I'm interested in um, the general view that you've developed and mm -hmm. the work that you've done relative to reading and also in the Hawaiian specific. We right. do plan to make a kind of a Hawaiian sequel to this. Mm -hmm. It'll be specific for the Hawaiian people mm -hmm. talking to mm -hmm. people um, that, that experience the challenge of learning to read from that different language or an oral base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, let me start with some basics then, and may <clears throat> it may lead to why I'm doing this. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, I assume this is kind of an interchange. Yeah, really yeah, relaxed, totally okay? Totally relaxed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's fair and rather obvious that reading takes place in the brain. Uh, I mean, uh, the neural circuitry that's there for language is the is the neural circuitry that we'll rely on for. Um, kind of taking that language mechanism and really appreciating how we use it for negotiating print. That's clear. And that's really a no-brainer. Uh, the, the part that's more complicated from my perspective is how do you take this peculiar conceit called an alphabetic writing system and get it in place in complex environments known as schools? I mean, while it takes place in the brain, teaching reading takes place in complex host environments known as schools. So most of my work for the last 10 years has been around understanding what it takes to get schools to appreciate the complexity of working with kids who have a difficult time uh, negotiating the alphabetic writing system. So that's a complex system when you talk about schools because you have people, you have pedagogies, you have personalities, you have principals. You have a lot of stuff coming together and interacting in complex ways. <clears throat> so when you have a complex interaction, whether it's a chemical interaction, a social interaction, uh, you have to understand what's responsible for that interaction. And in order to do that, you have to, in a sense, peel apart the threads, peel apart the pieces in order to understand what's responsible uh, for causing the interaction. Now, in the context of failure, when kids fail in a symbolic system, there are a lot of explanations, a lot of pieces we have to unpack. But that failure sets the stage for a fundamental ambiguity in terms of what's the primary um, cause for that failure. So kids aren't able to read. Kids come from uh, Waimanalo, kids come from Kalihi. And they come with their own language, <clears throat> and they come with their pidgin. They come with their own variation of the Creole, and they say, you know, "Bambaida baga going over there." And what they are coming with is the language they know. It's the only language they know. And for most of these kids that come to school, that language is sacred. They don't know that that language is is not represented in the print that they're going to see in school. So think about Hawaiian kids coming to school. They have this pigeon. They start looking at the print. And yet the words they own that they learn from their fathers, their mothers, their uncle, their aunts, their brothers and sisters are not represented in the English print. So right away you have a discrepancy between the language they speak every day out in the neighborhood with their families that are simply not represented in the print that's there. So right away, you have a discrepancy here. So how do we understand that discrepancy? Is it, 
Is the problem the failure with the child? Not at all. The child knows that. The child knows that language. So what it suggests is the system then has to appreciate that discrepancy, has to make an accommodation, has to make an adjustment uh, with respect to the child's language and that child's inability to map his or her language, namely the pigeon that he or she speaks every day to the English and the alphabetic writing system. So schools have to appreciate that. Hawaii uh, as a state uh, has been on the bottom of national assessment of educational progress for the last probably 12 years. Uh, that means that we've got a lot of work to do. Something's going on where the kids in Hawaii aren't getting it. They're not, at least, at least one explanation is they're not understanding that the speech they bring to school is not going to be representing the print. That when they say bambada baga, that bambada baga is not going to be representing English words. What they're saying is by and by that guy. And if they don't understand that discrepancy, they're not going to be able to grab the alphabetic insight that's so critical to reading. So to me, my challenge is really helping teachers, helping school systems put in place the organizational mechanisms, the, assist, uh, the accountability mechanisms, the instructional mechanisms that uh, have a fighting chance of working so that the odds are in children's favor. And my perspective is this is not about getting, giving schools a guarantee, but at least getting them to understand if I make this investment, in a 180-day school year, what's the likelihood that that investment's going to pay off? That's one. And what's the likelihood that the odds are in children's favor, 80% or more, that if they do this, if teachers do this, if principals do this, they're going to that investment um, will benefit kids so that the odds are in their favor at least 80% plus. So that's a big order. That's a big task. And there's a lot of ways for this to go wrong. And sometimes it goes wrong just because we can't get the pieces in place at the right time. If you accept that reading um, is about growth and development, we understand that growth and development doesn't happen in equal units per unit of time. We know that. We know that kids will get language more at one point in time in their early, earlier years, earlier stages of language acquisition than in their later years. So we need to understand how that growth and development changes over time and how the windows of opportunity also change and that schools, by virtue of the systems they are, really exaggerate those differences between kids. So we know that, I mean, Horace Mann says the schools are supposed to be the great equalizer of men. Well, the reality is that schools are really, uh, what they do is they exaggerate the differences that kids bring from their home settings, from their home opportunities, from their home language. So if that's the case, then we need to understand what are the mechanisms at different points in time in that growth and development that we need to accentuate, we need to put in place, we need to monitor, we need to maximize, we need to optimize so that kids, in fact, get the best opportunity so that schools will, in fact, be the great equalizer, not the great uh, exaggerator of differences between kids. Because we know kids come to school with differences. They come to school uh, with lots more. Some kids come to school with a lot of language. Other kids come to school with very little language. Some kids come to school with enormous exposure to literature, to good stories. Other kids don't. So those differences don't stay the same. They don't come to school and freeze. Those differences get greater over time. So we can put in place uh, lots of things to make that happen so that we can, in fact, have schools become the great equalizer of the, the, the economic opportunities for all kids. So, And I've been doing this now for 10 years. I've been doing this kind of work for uh, about 25 years. So my primary focus is how do you work with schools? What are the active ingredients that are required to get everybody on the same page with respect to this outcome so that all kids can reach a level of performance, a criterion level of performance that's predictive of their ability to, uh, to negotiate the symbolic system in the future? So I'm not looking to just improve schools because you can improve schools and schools still uh, don't do the things you want them to do. So I want them to get to a criterion level of performance, through a threshold where we know if they're there, 
the odds are in their favor that they can do those things that we expect them to do as uh, citizens in society and so on. I appreciate the point of view, that angle that you can have. Um, we're concerning ourselves with a lot more than just the production of a documentary. We, can, we call ourselves a um, social education project <laughs> and a television documentary, <laughs> and for a reason. I mean, we're trying to find out, all right, just what are all the constituent <laughs> players in all of this? <laughs> How do we make <laughs> the kind of change that's <laughs> necessary so that so many children don't <laughs> hit the wall and have Absolutely. their lives mangled? Absolutely. because. They couldn't negotiate this radically artificial That's right. confusion That's right. induced by a technological artifact that That's we right. have been ignorant and negligent about. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get that on tape? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the camera on him. <laughs> uh, no, that's absolutely so, right. So um, we are also interested in all the different perspectives that go into this, both from the micro time of what's mm -hmm. going on in the neuroscience mm -hmm. point of view but also in the uh, cultural environment. Mm -hmm. what's going on. And what you described isn't restricted to um, the people of Native Hawaiian. No, history. not at all. This is anybody who comes mm -hmm. with a, a variation mm -hmm. of oral language That's proficiency right. using Absolutely. different tones, different That's right. amount of sound. Element. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, That's right. So what, <clears throat> implicit in where you're going, then, there must be more uh, specific instruments that you're using mm -hmm. to assess where mm -hmm. children are at mm -hmm. in a new kind of map mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. allow educators to see these differences, <laughs> yeah. as well as some way to conceptualize this that gets through their mm -hmm. resistance. Yes. I mean, ultimately, this comes down to social inertia. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Right? So we, yep. have to, we have to find out where are the holding right. pins that are keeping right. the social inertia right. in place, that's just right. radiating in parents and in teachers. Yeah, that's right. A big part of that is, you know, yeah. both instrumenting the, the mechanics, mm -hmm. but also getting at mm -hmm. the underlying emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I, so tell me about more mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. Well, there, there are some things that are rather traditional and rather predictable in terms of getting schools to scale up to make this kind of difference. You know, obviously you need, you need a curriculum. You need a way of uh, codifying uh, the activities that you, the society and the research deems as critical for kids to be proficient in a language system, in a writing system. Okay, so you need tools. You need, teachers need to have a curriculum. Um, and the assumption is that curriculum is valid, it's reliable, it's been tested, it has all the critical elements that are associated with this conceit called the alphabetic writing system, and that it's uh, based on research. So there are a lot of things that schools already have in place that we, will, we would continue to, to argue that they ought to have in place. Uh, effective research-based curriculum. Now we don't, so that's one, the curriculum piece. Now the question is, do we have the right curriculum? Is it a curriculum that uh, the public would argue is the best intervention possible? It's tested, it's trustworthy. I think right now uh, the answer is no, we don't, because we don't have the resources, at least we, up to this point, we don't have the resources to really test in a research a satisfying way, experimental control group way, uh, curricula that uh, allows us to say, yeah, if you pit curriculum A against curriculum B, we have sufficient evidence to suggest that curriculum A uh, gives you the greatest impact for your investment because it gets kids to the kind of reading achievement outcomes you want. We're getting there. We still need a lot of work to do. We have a handful of programs that have some empirical evidence uh, that suggests that if you implement the program, kids will benefit from the implementation, assuming the implementation has a high level of fidelity. So that's one big piece, getting the curriculum. There would be some kids. Um, and that's, yeah, and that's, uh, the curriculum doesn't, it's not one curriculum, uh, there's not one curriculum that fits all. So that's one of the problems. So we need multiple types of curricula. We need a core curricula for most of the kids, assuming that you have a normal distribution of uh, aptitude and a, uh, performance. But you also need curriculum that, and those, those curricula kind of, what we characterize as core curricula. Those curricula are vertical. The architecture is such that it tries to cover a lot of stuff in a short period of time. So it's horizontal, not vertical. I said vertical, I meant horizontal. So it's gonna cover a wide range of things, but it's not gonna go very deep. 
So in addition to the core curriculum, we need supplemental curriculum that will supplement the holes that you're going to find in the core curriculum. So for example, if we assert that alphabetic insight is critical to reading, the phonics piece, then not all the curriculum, not all curricula will have the same amount of intensity and explicitness as they should around teaching phonics. So we may want to adopt a supplemental curriculum to enhance the core curriculum. So that's two pieces of the curriculum puzzle, core curriculum, a supplemental curriculum. And then finally, you're going to need a curriculum that's very different in architecture for the kids are in the bottom 20, 25%, because the way they manage information is very different from the kids who can benefit from the core. That kind of curriculum we refer to as an intervention curriculum, because the architecture is very different. The architecture is should be uh, more careful in how it thinks about uh, the examples that are used, how it juxtaposes examples, the amount of scaffolding and teacher wording that's provided, the amount of practice, how much practice is given at any given point in time, how much scaffolding is provided, how much rehearsal, how much fluency is built in. It's more direct instruction and control. Possibly, possibly. It need not be direct yeah, instruction. Kind of yeah, particular, right, right, but right. It's basic model of of reducing the extraneous ambiguity. That's right. Focusing on particular objectives. Absolutely. Step, 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 yeah. step, That's right. Less flexibility. That's right. More systematic, uh, more intentional, more aligned with the kind of outcomes, more uh, considerate in the kinds of tasks that select, the examples, the range of examples, and so on. So, obviously, the curriculum piece since that's the primary way we promote the symbolic system, we have to make sure that the curricula reflect the best science we have going. So that's a big piece. So we've got this, this deep nuclear kind of underlying uh, horizontal progression of things that kind of everybody needs that's to right. go through. That's right. We have to differentiate it so it meets exactly. the variations and needs for exactly. each individual. Exactly, nicely put. Okay. Yeah, it's a differentiated curriculum. It's differentiated instruction. Um, kids are going to come in at different points. So our ability to differentiate comes down to either it's, it's actually folding around and responding to the individual variations in need that's expressed by the student, or right. it's presumptive. We're making some kind of assessment. That's right. It's a Renaissance cannon fire. We say, okay, we're going to shoot over here and measure, and we're going to adjust and shoot again. And that's right. It's kind of got that kind of loop in it. Exactly, exactly. But sometimes the measurement has to be more sensitive than we typically are familiar with and used to. Exactly. Certainly with the kids on the learning. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. We talk about getting to 100% of the kids, but you don't, don't get to 100% unless you go through the bottom 20%. So we can talk about all kids, but the, re the reality is that our real task with schools to get all kids reading is really focusing on the bottom 20%. How do we do that? Because those kids are the toughest ones. They're tough because they may not have the language uh, experience that they should have. Uh, they may have different kinds of experiences that don't square with the experience that are in place in terms of social, culture, uh, etc. Uh, they may go to schools that don't provide them the opportunities, don't provide them the kind of support that uh, they should get. They may come from homes that uh, don't provide them the kind of opportunities uh, that you would like them to have. Lots of different reasons. So um, <clears throat> differentiating um, those resources so that we can maximize the resources at the right point in time, at the right spots, uh, in the right places, uh, also requires not only curriculum, but an assessment system. Now, assessment is a big piece of this. Um, and I'm not talking about traditional assessment per se. Traditional assessment obviously is a big piece of it. But the piece that's been missing that represents, I think, a new genre of assessment is assessment that's uh, uh, timely, um, efficient, parsimonious, targeted to the most essential active ingredients so that kids uh, can participate in the writing system uh, readily. Um, recursive in that you can get feedback from it and uh, and has the capacity to go to scale with the technology, the information technology that's available. So for example, most assessment we think about is outcome assessment. 
achievement tests, high stakes tests. Way downstream from Downstream, exactly. Downstream, end of third grade, end of fourth grade, end of eighth grade, end of twelfth grade. Or, or end of the actual stream of flow that's at the core of the progress. Absolutely. It's measuring it a day later, an hour later, it's still that's, downstream. That's right. It's not timely, it's not in real time, and so on. The assessment system we've been working with, I think, is a significant departure from traditional assessment because it takes a sample of behavior in one minute, a one-minute sample of a child's reading behavior. It's fluency-based, and it's predictive of the future. So if you think about it, what I'm asserting is that in one minute, in a one-minute sample, you can get a rep sufficient representation of a child's ability to negotiate the alphabetic writing system. And that uh, sample is predictive of how that child's going to be down the road. So if I take a sample of a child's behavior at the end of kindergarten, it's predictive of how that child will do at the end of third grade. Now that, to me, is an assessment system that uh, is powerful, is, uh, is necessary, and, and uh, also is one that we can get to scale. And that's what we're using right now. Because right now there's such a coarse correspondence between the gross level of problems that these kids may be having and their later That's right. I could see how a one minute sample could lead to that. The question is, how finely are you understanding the specific kind of variation of performance that's going on inside the processing of that individual child so uh -huh. that it actually informs the instruction uh -huh. in a way that meets them exactly. in the flow of their behavior exactly. better? Yeah. How does that one minute connect yeah. to that? Well, it depends on what you sample. Because what you sample is going to be critical to the kind of adjustment you make in instruction. So in the research on beginning reading, we generally target five different pieces. Phonological awareness, where basically it deals with the sound system independent of any text. And the idea is that uh, the sound system is predictive of how we read in text. So, I mean, that's a peculiar thing in itself. That Well, if we take the model like you started with, uh -huh. that reading is really the player piano of a virtually playing the audio sound system that uh -huh. we start with. That's right, right. that's right. Th then um, how well that, that oral language system is functioning is, is the undercarriage. So that's right. Has to function. That's so right. If you go and assess that, there's something wrong with it. Obviously, nothing else is going to work. That's right. If that's not working. That's well. right, that's right. But most people have would find that peculiar, that, um, that you're using an uh, auditory signal system predict that, that you grab, you sample in the absence of print to predict print. It's counterintuitive. How can I use sound? Well, we got to make that intuitive because that's really clear. Right uh, now. That, ab <laughs> absolutely, but that's teachers. A fa that's a that's a failure to understand what reading is at a basic That's level. right, absolutely. And lots of believe it or not, lots of practitioners have that uh, difficult time understanding how. Which comes back to horse man again. Be, that's right, exactly. <laughs> which comes back to horse horse man and so on. Exactly. So we we assess phonological awareness. We assess we assess critical parts of phonological awareness that are that are predictive of word reading. So for example, for example, segmenting a word like mud. Tell me the first sound in mud. Mm. That task is more predictive of word reading than rhyming. So our one minute assessment, which by the way is called the Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills (Dibbles). And it's created by a colleague here at the University of Oregon, two colleagues, are Roland Good, Drs. Roland Good and Ruth Kaminsky. And it's now used in almost every state, which is part of the Reading First initiative. So we sample phonological awareness, we sample word reading, pseudo word reading. And again, the idea is that if kids can manipulate and map the sounds to print in words that don't make sense, you get a pretty good indicator of their ability to map sound to print. You're peering in on the You're, implicate processing. That's right. We're peering in on their ability to take sound and map it to print in words that uh, they don't see every day, pseudo words, nonsense words. Yet that sample, one minute sample, is predictive of their ability to read words in real print. Uh, con uh, conventional words and so on. So you're concerned with whether or not, even though they don't know the word or the word doesn't exist, can they pronounce the Can word they pronounce? According to the instructions implicit in the code because Absolutely. the phonological system is working and they're able to map it to the code. That, you got it. Absolutely.
They've got the sound sound signal intact. They've got the ability to take the sound system and map it to the print. And then the third piece we rely on is oral reading fluency. And this is a measure of uh, a child reading a passage that he or she has not read before, a novel passage at grade level, reading it for one minute, and we count the number of words they read correctly. We don't ask any comprehension questions. Yet that indicator of words, correct words read per minute, is highly predictive of children's comprehension ability. So again, these are constructs that the practitioner in the classroom is only beginning to embrace. And these are constructs that are critical to the, the composite of reading. We can sample these behaviors in one minute, and these samples, one minute samples, are very predictive of highly critical reading uh, skills down the road. So to me, that's a heck of a deal to be able to sample something in a minute Enter it into a database system, get reports back in 32 seconds. You can get class reports, school level reports, district level reports, so that teachers can take these reports and use them because the reports also make instructional recommendations based on the performance on the actual score and the risk category. So, so they're, they're diagnostic and prescriptive. They're diagnostic and prescriptive, exactly. They tell you based on the score what the risk category is, if the child is at low risk or at some risk or, at, or is in fact at uh, high risk. And if the child's at low risk, that means that child has an 80% chance of, the child's already at benchmark, that child can go on and do other things if that child's at risk, that means the child has, unless the school intervenes on those particular constructs, phonological awareness, vocabulary, reading comprehension, fluency, uh, alphabetic principle, uh, that the odds of that child being successful down the road are not in his or her favor. So we can get this system, and we have over a million kids in that Dibbles database right now that allows us to harvest these data, look at the schools that are doing well, and make predictions about how they're going to do in the future. So that's two major pieces of understanding this complex host environment known as schools. Do we have the right curriculum in place? Do, are we using and employing curricula that we know are effective, that are based, that is based on the best science? Do we have three tiers of uh, tools that we can use? Core curriculum. Do we have supplemental curriculum? Do we have intervention? Which are just gross. Um Absolutely. That's right. For management purposes. Absolutely. Want a fluid That's right. Seamless on. system. Right. Exactly. Because you've got individual variation across the range. And we're using, again, all of this is a conceit. We're using different pieces to get at, because we're not going to be able to have one-on-one -on -one for every child. So we use a core curriculum to teach most of the kids. One on 20, one on 25. We use a supplemental curriculum to supplement that core curriculum. And then we use an intervention curriculum to do one to one or one to three or one to eight. I mean, again, because of the resources that uh, we have available, we have to be smart about how to use those resources in a way that allows us to acknowledge the differentiation and acknowledge the, the differences in terms of risk, but at the same time try to have an impact. So that's the curriculum piece. The other piece is getting a progress monitoring system in place that allows us to, to measure growth and assess growth every week, if, every week if we have to, so that we can determine whether or not the instruction that's going on is making a difference. So you need an assessment system that's sensitive to change, sensitive to growth. So and the so basic uh, Dibble mechanism can slide across the scale and pick up the same implicate readings no matter where they are, at what content level, to be able to, to feed back into this assessment that prescribes the that's right. pieces you're describing. That's right. You, you hit a ceiling because once you get the, I mean, we have basically a handful of measures. We can tap the logic awareness in a minute, lots of different ways. We can tap um, the phonics piece, the alphabetic principle, through pseudo word reading or even word identification reading in one minute. Uh, that, last, mm -hmm. that last point would imply that you've uh, picked out what you think are the most problematic that's right. to, to focus on. That's you're right. You're not going to hit the spectrum. You're not going to hit all of it. That's right. So, I mean, so, so you've got a top five list. That's right. Where are the greatest uh, yeah. letter sound correspondence confusions? that they're tripping on and you're actually intentionally constructing their one minute experiences to reveal how they're dealing with the most difficult challenges. Exactly. No, you've, you've captured. I mean, reading is a categorical mistake.
I mean, it's a construct that's so unwieldy that you can assign anything you want. You can define it in way you choose. One of my colleagues that I used to teach with used to argue that reading is about human emancipation. My response is reading is about reading in a writing system, and in this case, in an alphabetic writing system. Those are two very different interpretations of reading. So yes, it's a categorical mistake. It's an unwieldy category. So we have to make decisions about this peculiar conceit. We can't tap it all. So the question is, what does the research tell us about what is most essential in, to tap? Phonological awareness. Alphabetic principle, alphabetic insight, taking the sounds and mapping onto the print, vocabulary development. Children who know a lot of words have a storehouse of uh, words, have this kind of dictionary in their head. Those kids have this kind of Home Depot of words in their head that they can draw on. They've got a lower uh, threshold of recognition, which speeds the reading process because they, they, they can hear the word in their head. That's right. They've got an instant. Been, that's they, right. They've got to figure out, does this word make sense? That's right. Exactly. It's exactly. Challenge. That's this right. The fourth grade slump. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So they have to have a something there, a representation from the environment that it, they can hook up to when somebody Until says. Until they get confident that it's okay not to have that. That's right. They can assemble things and figure out what they, they can make it up on their own. That's this right. This is the confusion of where it's okay to use context to deduce things. Exactly. It's exactly. Okay on the latter part. It's not That's okay. right. It's not okay in the in the earlier part. Exactly. I got to take you to task on the alphabetic insight. Sure. Um, people use that a lot. Uh -huh. Reed Lyon uses that. And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of suggestive of a singular event, you know, of a, a principle, meaning something that's relatively stable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Once you get it, it's there. Mm -hmm. Or an insight, which is a singular event. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, yeah. But um, the correspondence between the alphabet and the sound system is anything but a single principle that's right. that's or right. a yeah. single yeah. insight. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. But, but there is a moment where for the child who is not understood, like the child in Waimanala, Hawaii, who, who will use words and not understand that words have a concrete representation until they see the concrete present representation. And they'll say, ah, I thought that word was this, but the word not this, it's that. That's an insight. Right. To, to yeah. get that there's a fundamental correspondence That's right. between this speaking and That's this right. Writing. Exactly. Yes. That's They're right. after. They're after, talking yeah. Talking about the development there's no. of these, That's right. these internal processing yeah. reflexes yeah. that create this virtual reality stream, yeah. which is That's right. That's right. an entirely That's right. different business. Yeah, the insight is, an, is I say, a, a, an important part, but it's not all. You're absolutely yeah. right. When it's the principle. kids that are struggling on the downside, I mean... The, I would imagine that only a small percent of them are having a problem getting the insight. They're having a problem yeah. on the other side of the insight between Once they, there and That's right. Absolutely. Fluent, that's uh, right. That's right. How to continue to make the connections. The that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's All fair right. enough. That's okay. fair enough. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you mentioned that uh, you can you infer comprehension from part three of your Or reading fluency. Based on the, the rate at which they're, they're moving. Uh, that's through. right. Because that implies that their processing ecology that's is right. up to a certain level. It's not consuming brain bandwidth, and they're able to be more comprehensive. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's your assumption? That's my assumption. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know how many kids that have talked to people like uh, Nancy Bell, mm -hmm. who's on, on the side of, geez, there's a lot of kids that, that are uh, you know reading words uh, very clearly, mm -hmm. no errors, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. great stream, mm -hmm. and yet they mm -hmm. still don't understand anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't she's know about like, a lot of words, a lot of kids. Yeah, she's like talking 40% or something. Oh, I... Uh, yeah, my sense is the big trap with comprehension is right here where you put your finger. Absolutely. That it, that it, it's, yeah. it, it's the poor ecology of the underlying processing that's dragging the processing resources down that are necessary for reflective, process, uh, reflective comprehension. That's right. Not the, you know, subsequent to that. Yeah, well, the, the, you can't comprehend words if you can't read the words. you got to first read the words. Sure. But, but so, the, the argument is, is, is all right, there's, there, at least in this case, the uh -huh. kids that are reading the words fine, but they're still not getting it. Absolutely. That's a different problem. Yeah. That's a different problem. But I'm I, asking in the spectrum of things. 
That's a small problem. Okay. That's, that's a, I mean, those are hyperlexic kids. Those yeah. are kids for that somehow get access to the code, but can't comprehend and don't have the semantic experience with words to make connection they to them. They can't go meta and implicate it all into no, something. No, not understand. exactly. Exactly. Okay. But those kids are very, very few. Okay. I mean, on a population basis, I'd be surprised if it's one percent. I my hunch, no, but if, too from yeah, my yeah, yeah. So, so if Nancy's so, arguing forty percent, that uh, I don't want to misquote her. Yeah, yeah, but but, 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 but she made a big thing of that. And yeah. at the time, I was kind of sorry yeah, to right, check right. that with yeah. you. Um, talking about where kids break down the spectrum of things, one of the things that we're really interested in is um, this basic proficiency divide mm -hmm. and the difference, the distinction. It seems that. Um, when we're talking about below basic, we're talking about the inability to create a coherent code stream, or to, to create an internal word stream or an, art, mm -hmm. an externally spoken word stream, that it just doesn't cohere and snap to mm -hmm. a level that's even instrumental. Mm -hmm. So they can't even um, read well enough to understand pretty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that um, between there and proficiency is the level that we were talking about a moment ago on the third level of your assessment, where they're reading smoothly enough that they're able to be reflective about mm -hmm. it, rather mm -hmm. than being so consumed just mm -hmm. generating the mm -hmm. reading experience. Mm -hmm. um, what's your sense of the difference between basic and proficiency, and what, what mm -hmm. import do you give to it at all? Well, you know, those are um, nominal distinctions that we use in terms of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. A lot of states make that distinguish a distinction between basic and below basic and then proficient and then advanced and so on. And um, I suppose what that means in the general sense is basic means that they're reading at grade level. Below basic is, means they're reading below grade level. Proficient means they're reading beyond, they're, they're able to negotiate the grade level materials in a way that they, are, they can use their thinking flexibly, they can make inferences that go beyond the text and so on. To me, that's, that's, um, oops, sorry, that's less than um, helpful. Because to me, it's not about basic, below basic. To me, what's critical is what's the criterion level of performance that's required, the minimum criterion level of performance that's required for kids to read at a level that will predict their ability to read in the future. So it's a predictability longitudinal framework that I'm looking at. If I get to a criterion level here on, remember reading is a composite of a lot of different things. The sound system, phonological awareness, the sound mapping to print, the alphabetic principle, the vocabulary, the reading comprehension. So I want to know if all those pieces are important, what's the criterion level I need on the sound system, on the phonological awareness, that's predictive of being able to read words? What's the word reading piece that's predictive of reading in text? What's the text reading piece that's predictive of reading more complex expository text that gets me a comprehension? So to me, there, there's a, a set of linkages in this complex system that we need to tap into because if the system breaks down, then we can go in and deal with individual components and try to fix those pieces, bring kids up to criterion level, and then move on. I mean, otherwise, if we can't do it on a component by component basis, I don't know how you get at it. Yeah, and you get into the arguments that lead to this big fuzzy. Absolutely, piece. absolutely. Phonics right. versus whole language, right. whatever. It's Horace silly. Man, that's right, <laughs> that's right, exactly. So, that's the way I think about it. See, I mean, and I understand that. I mean, all of mm -hmm. these things at one level are descriptions. Um, they're kind of like uh, quantum probability mechanics, right? Looking at this population mm -hmm. of kids mm -hmm. and um, how to develop a system that mm -hmm. will adjust. And it's very external mechanical. I mean, mm -hmm. our intention, your intention, I can tell mm -hmm. in your heart, I can tell from how you describe it when we get there, is that... We want children to have an experience of reading, mm -hmm. which is as transparent to their, their coming and going of meaning right. as their use of their spoken language. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm less concerned with how they see it, candidly, than I am with how the adults who are responsible for their success see it. How do teachers see it? Because their teachers are, by virtue of being in a public system, charged with the public trust of getting that child from a state of not being able to read or being partially able to read to competent. 
So to me, I'm less concerned as with some of my colleagues with the intricacies and nuances of what happens kind of the within individual variation as I am with the system variation and how do we build the infrastructure and the capacity so that the public trust gets realized, so that teachers, administrators, school board members, and so on, leverage the system in such a way that all kids can get to that threshold. I, I understand, that. yeah. and that's where the fulcrum is. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So the and just to shift it's where the wheel is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, yeah. All right. Um, there's another place that it connects for me, too, that I want to touch on. I don't know to what extent your work has taken you in this direction, but the way that this all looks to us, you know, and, and we're trying to bring in... Uh, affective, emotional science, and cognitive science, and the teacher and the classroom experience, and what's going on this round. It looks to us like a great number of our children are experiencing an unnatural form of confusion. It's a form of confusion that's happening in their brain mm -hmm. that evolution never experienced before. Mm -hmm. okay. It didn't happen before in nature. Mm -hmm. and it's a unique symbol, technological mm -hmm. right. thing, that's right. confusing them in their brain. That's right. And the environment around them, their parents, their mm -hmm, teachers, mm -hmm, particularly mm -hmm. their peers, mm -hmm. has created a context in which mm -hmm. they feel mm -hmm. like something's wrong with them because they're right. confused. That's right. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it's human, their fault. Yeah. Right. So now human beings are almost, by second nature, shame averse. We don't like to do things that make right. us feel shame. That's right. That's right. right. That's right. So because reading's happening at a faster than conscious mm -hmm. assembly level, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. we're talking about a faster than conscious confusion mm -hmm. that the child is mm -hmm. feeling shame mm -hmm. of. So they're wanting to avoid that's that right. confusion. That's right. Absolutely. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? Yeah, that's right. Who wants so, to fail? So we've got millions yeah. and millions of children growing up feeling ashamed of their mind that's right. and wanting to avoid confusion. That's right. Which decapitates learning. That's right. Yeah, they don't want to read because they're not good at reading. They avoid reading. They'd rather clean the bathroom than read. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the interesting thing here is that not only is this all of the emotional trauma that we can imagine, yeah. but from a cognitive science right. point of view, the moment this shame starts to trigger, mm -hmm. it burns yeah, the that's right. brain resources that's right. necessary that's to process right. the that's right. in the first yeah. place in a downward spiral. That's right. So. that's right. That's right. It, uh, the teacher's got to get this. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. It basically um, takes hostage, takes the cognition hostage. Yeah, it paralyzes the child. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, you're right. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, you know, Harold Bloom has a book called uh, Why We Read, something like that. Yeah, this is the, uh, Harold Bloom is a Shakespearean scholar at Yale. And he says, the reason we read is to develop self-trust. And developing self-trust takes years of deep reading. So kids who don't read don't develop that self-trust because they can't get access to the information. They can't get access to ideation. They don't develop a self-trust in their ability to be abstractly self-reflective. Absolutely. That's <laughs> they a self-trust. That's right. <laughs> That's that. right. That's right. That's right. They can't compete at the idea level because they don't have enough ideas that they can grab. Or the complexity or of the, the intellectual com abstract exactly, process. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's what I like about Stanovich and the others, who are basically, you know, what reading does for the mind. Absolutely. That's this right. is a whole other lobe and yeah, dimension of right. virtual human extension that's right. that yeah. we need to survive in the world today. And yeah, that that's right. if we shame out on it, we're in yeah. big trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jonathan Kozel says, right, if you don't read, you don't make choices. How can you? So, um, so it's critical. And we can do this. The, the, the thing that's so frustrating, almost debilitating from a professional perspective, is there's no reason for this not to happen. No reason to have the, not have the infrastructure in place so that all kids can get to a point where they can make choices. They can get access to ideas. No reason. We have the research, we have the technology. FedEx can mail packages, and three billion packages around the world every day. They can track every package in every country. They know where that package goes. Dairy farmers can milk their cows and predict the yields based on the information technology that we have available. No reason why we can't track children performance and their growth. Sensitive to measures about this complex symbolic system. No reason at all. But if you ask yourself, how many school systems have a progress monitoring system 
that allows them to track children's performance on a day-to-day -day basis on a, the most critical symbolic system there is? My hunch is you'll say not very many. Yet we have this technology that's available. To me, it is so critical uh, that we invoke the public imagination and will to get this done. That's why we're here. We're trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Speaking of technology, though, I have, I have to go in this direction now that we brought the technology thing up. I mean, this whole thing is a piece of technology. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, <laughs> you, That's right. you go through uh, and track down the trails of it, and this is invented by 26, 26 scribes in 1440, <laughs> right? In order so King Henry V can raise money from people back home that only speak English, right? <laughs> After 200 years of the French and the Latin being the primary language in England. That's it was right. written by scribes who don't even speak English, who are mapping over, much the way the priests did in Hawaii, this sound system <laughs> right. to the English sound system. And this thing develops an inertia uh -huh. that tumbles through. And, and our inability to deal with this thing as a code, as a technology, right. it is the most fundamental technology absolutely. in terms of affecting our culture. That's right. There is. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. No disagreement. But we won't touch it. Well, we touch it, but we have uh, sometimes we have uh, peculiar ideas about how to touch it and how to bring it to life. Right. I mean, yeah. there, you know, Ben Franklin, That's right. you know, Webster, whose history of changed the alphabet, changed the spelling, and then yeah. he established inertia. Yeah. I mean, are you yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Just because some kids can read. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the the just more, I mean, even more recently, the whole idea that reading comes naturally. I mean, this was invoked uh, no more, no less than. Uh, no more than, what, 10, 15 years ago. Yes, and it paralyzed the professional community. And the public raised their hands in dismay, saying, what the heck are you guys doing? We well, I, want... think that, I think that from my conversation with Crash and Alex uh -huh, and the people uh -huh, on that uh -huh, side, uh -huh. um, um, I think that their sense is, is that... Oops. Excuse me. I thought I killed it. <laughs> that um, it's not that reading the code and all that is natural, but that... Uh, if we create the right kind of environment, the best way to learn it is by, by uh, a kind of direct instructional staging that allows the child's mind to work it out. They, they said than, that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm oh. paraphrasing them a bit. Crashing and Allington? Um, well, Allington, Allington's yeah. a, a bit on the other side, but he actually compared it to dancing. And I just said, are you, I mean, come on. <laughs> See, that's a terrible analogy. Let me tell you more. Well, thing. because dancing is a physical task. It's a non-symbolic activity where the environment gives you instant feedback about your behavior. If you trip, you know you trip. That's not the case with a symbolic system. If you trip on the symbolic system, the words are not going to yell at you, say, hey, you got me wrong. They're going to slay there and say, you idiot. You can't even read me. I mean, so th that analogy for Dick is absolutely the wrong analogy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. no, I know you're, I, I know, but. Yeah, and that was exactly my point. We yeah. read the transcript or listen to it at yeah. some point. No, no, my problem with, uh, with the, the, what can be characterized probably wrongly as whole language is the idea that you can sample the print and get an adequate sample of propositions that will tell you what the text is conveying. Yes. And that to me is wrong because that's not how the technology with the eyes, in terms of eyes making contact with uh, the images and the, and the print works. I mean, you the read every word. Ab wired to, oh. to extend itself through feedback. Absolutely. Its Absolutely. Own proprioceptive that's right. And when it doesn't have that, it's depending on the external system that's right. to guide it into the kind of learning. And the, exactly. And if we need an external support system to monitor, anything i mean it's on the symbolic system yeah. absolutely that's why we need an external monitor to tell us when we're going wrong in the symbolic system because the symbolic system is absolutely inert nothing to respond period so that's why human beings need to mediate that symbolic function yep great hey, this has been fantastic oh I'm excellent okay oh good great tools here good uh, Corey? just back to the Kind of personal background. Sure. Oh, yeah. Why do you do what you oh, do? Okay. What is the. Yeah, I didn't talk about that, didn't it? Yeah. What, it's what implicit. Your passion, it is implicit, yeah. but yeah. also just yeah. in, in 
On the camera. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Well, um... Glad you are. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I grew up uh, in a household, uh, and my dad was pure Hawaiian, um, had a high school education. My mom was Hawaiian Chinese, had a high school education. My mom was deaf. Um, they didn't promote school a lot, um, and I went to a very uh, prominent school for children of Hawaiian ancestry. You know it as Kamehameha. And at the time, Kamehameha had a tracking system where kids who were tested at a particular point in time were put in uh, different sections. And I happened to end up in a section that wasn't uh, college bound, namely the very last section. <laughs> so, uh, and I struggled with, uh, with, with reading. Uh, and because my mom was deaf, I always struggled with how do kid, people take in information? How do they negotiate this, uh, this stuff? So, um, that always stayed in the back of my mind, but I majored in English literature, studied Shakespeare, studied Keats was my primary focus. Uh, couldn't find a job and then ended up working at a residential treatment center for children identified with serious behavior problems in Wisconsin. And that introduced me not to behavior problems, but to learning problems. Because kids who have behavior problems have serious learning problems. And the behavior just masked the, the learning problems. I could manage the behavior. I could manage how to get them to sit down, how to do their work. I couldn't teach them. And that's why <laughs> I got interested in this. How do you get kids to get the stuff that's out there represented in the occipital temporal lobe, in the parietal <laughs> temporal lobe, in the different parts of the brain that allow us to use our systems efficiently and be able to be imaginative? I mean, I, I enjoyed reading Shakespeare, but here are kids who could not get access to it. And it just puzzled me. How do we do this? So it's really based on that experience that I started. Uh, uh, I, said, I looked around at the university and I said, what university will tell me, teach me how to teach? And I came to the University of Oregon, did my doctorate work here. And then uh, from there on, went other places, taught and then returned here. So... And inside of the learning disability or learning differences yeah. that you encountered, yeah. was the big dog. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hands down. Hands down. Yeah, I mean, I work with colleagues. I have great colleagues here who work with serious behavior problems. And I could have done that because that's there. But I realized that's not, that to me was not the problem. The problem was in the learning, in the acquisition of information, retention, and so on. So, yeah. But thanks for asking. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. A, great, great answer. Great it's a, yeah. a great connection and, and insight. I huh. always love people. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. And as we, um, it's I think it's good for readers too, for people who are learning into the space when they read the transcript, they get a, a yeah, a, yeah, right. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, um, <clears throat> There's a conversation between uh, us and uh, James Wendorf, hmm. and uh, he won't touch this. Uh, hmm. He won't you know, <laughs> go around it. But it's, uh, it seems to me that the nation's biggest learning disability is engendered by the process of learning to read. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the most public... Mm. Widespread, most widespread thing that happens to absolutely. human beings is the process. Yeah, of absolutely. Through. Yeah, and the most public. Really, you can hide. I mean, for example, te I mean, you can hide from the math stuff. You can get away with the math because you have enough other systems that can help you on that. But the reading one is tough. Hard to hide on that one. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Well, overheating. You hanging in there? No, I'm, are we done? Uh, oh, I, I I really like the duels we got. Um, okay. Is there anything else? That is there something else that you like? think, giving you a sense of what we're up to and uh, where we've touched? Something else that's hot for you? Boy, you know, there's so many other pieces. But I mean, you could talk about school leadership. We know the school principals play a critical role. I mean, we find that man. We won't work with the school if the principal is not. Oh, absolutely. Just it doesn't make sense. It goes sideways. It from the head. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, yeah. the kids are the ones who suffer. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you know, but Which means uh, that principal institutes really need to get savvy oh, about how fundamentally absolutely. important this yes. is. At the Absolutely. behavioral that's level, a, that's the, right. that's the right. social pathological that's right. level, at the yeah. general uh, grade right. level. It's not just that's a right. thing that That's happens. right. Exactly. 
Music and, is so much more than reading. Exactly. The, and the other piece uh, is just about the research piece, how we fail as a profession, and maybe as a public to understand the critical importance of what good research means and how to do science in education. Our, our, our profession, education, is so immature in the way we do science, the way we think about it, uh, that that to me is enormously bothersome. And people, researchers at public universities, it seems to me, have a special obligation to do that research and not hide behind the tenure thing and the whole academic freedom thing. Um, uh, that's bothersome to me. So, you know, if you, if you look at the complexity of organizations that are responsible, higher ed is responsible for preparing teachers. Well, how do we get higher ed to prepare teachers with the science that is invoked at the time? That is, yeah, and, and, and which politics now, and absolutely, all the and who's I don't want to that's go right, along with it this that's right, that's right, exactly, yeah, exactly, the ones advocating it. Ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> all that stuff, exactly. So, uh, but yeah, yeah <laughs> so yeah, many different pieces. Are you involved with the Hunt Foundation's Power for Kids? Yes, yeah. uh -huh, yeah, I'm on the advisory board. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought that's yeah. Good. So they're working to yes. try to put the, the list out there. That's right, right. exactly. And we are too. I mean, through reading first, reading first, trying to do that. The, the first, uh, and the yeah, that's right. And Russ, that exactly yeah. what works. Uh, so that reminded me of something. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm going to shut off the camera. I have two things I want to talk to you about without being any okay. thing on. Okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Is there anything else? How are we doing on time? I'm good. We have four minutes left. On this. Oh, that's perfect. Is there anything else? You want to no. Do? Thank you.